I'm Razzle of Collinwood for YouTube, Jules Sainz, joined by the author of the Dark Shadows Day book about Patrick McRae. We're here to discuss episode 457. Uh, th this episode is uh, narrated by Nancy Barrett, written by Gordon Russell, and it is the Dark Shadows director debut of one Dan Curtis. This is Dan's first episode that he directs. Go ahead, Patrick. Yes, it certainly is. Oh, so much, so much to say about this episode. Um, uh, where do I begin? Um, it's, it's, uh, it could be anywhere, um, but uh, it's especially fascinating because for some reason I, I thought we were watching episode uh, 1113. So, um, uh, yes, here we are. Um, however, um, what an episode it was. You know, Dan Curtis directed this episode, and it was the first episode Dan Curtis directed. Dan Curtis will go on to be a great, great director, and I think we can thank this episode as being key to what I just said. I do have a question for you with this, too. What, why do you think he... Absolutely. With Absolutely. this episode, why do you think he sort of picked this episode to direct? You think there's a reason behind it? So many reasons, Jewel. I think there's a reason behind everything. Um, and I think he chose this to be the, the first episode he directed because he had never directed an episode before. Yeah. Yeah, he... I mentioned this on my live stream last night with this, that 456 episodes go by and Dan doesn't direct one. <laughs> and it's it's this episode he directs. And when I was watched, when I had watched, it's insanity. I right. When I had watched this, and I want to I want to get your thoughts on this. There's a now I want to be very clear. Dark Shadows the series is not. House of Dark Shadows, none of the Dark Shadows movies are canon to the original series. I want to make that very clear. Um, but with this episode, I'm sort of... Even the original series is not canon to it. Right. That's what I'm meaning, too. Like, with with this, with the original series, it's not canon to House or Night. But I noticed something about this episode, and I know it's written by Gordon Russell, but... Dan's direction of this episode, I think, is pretty influential here on why House gets made. Sure, of course, because, of course, because House couldn't have been made without it being influential. Well, here's the thing: I know they use, like, I know they use the Maggie Evans, a bit of the Maggie Evans storyline for House. They just alter it a bit with this. Now, I know they're not using 1795, but I noticed something in this episode with Jonathan Frid, you know, saying, if I if I stay in this tower room, I'm going to go crazy. So that's your hint that Jonathan's Barnabas did go crazy, trapped in that coffin all that time. And I noticed in this episode yes. that now he he was a bit antagonistic when he first came out of the coffin with kidnapping Maggie, but he's a bit antagonistic here too to a degree by you know summoning he's summoning Millicent. He's biting Millicent, you know, his mother witnesses it. The scream is really well done. It sort of reminded me of House mm -hmm. of Dark Shadows just a teeny bit. Yeah, I, I, you know, I don't know if he had the movie planned yet. I, you know, this episode was, this episode was filmed uh, on March 26, 1968. So it's just a little under a year, or it's broadcast March 26, 1968. So it's just a little under a year from Barnabas's first appearance. Yeah. I don't know when he started thinking about uh you know feature films right um but it certainly was a good proving ground and and do you think there's something especially cinematic about this episode yeah there is the the very we get a we get really great cinematography and we get 
really great close-ups of Jonathan in the tower room. The close-ups of Jonathan in the yes. tower room are very cinematic. Yeah, you know, when 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 you are working for Dan Curtis, you have to get things done on a specific schedule, and sometimes art takes a back seat to yeah. that. When you are Dan Curtis, a lot of things suddenly take a back seat to you as director, and I think you know he's definitely flexing those muscles. Yeah, I, I in, in the best way. Right, I especially like too with this with episode four fifty seven that you get you get a lot of great moments from Ben Stokes in this episode too. Fair David, I love the line where he says about I met I met some. I thought I met some scum in prison and he's talking to the, Lieutenant Nathan Forbes yeah, and he's like, how dare you talk like that to me? He goes, I'll talk to you how I play. <laughs> he, he just, he, ben, does, ben is not pulling any punches. No. No, not at all. I don't know. Take that, jerky. Yeah. <laughs> what, did you, what did you think of, because for the long time in Dark Shadows there was always the if if you found out a secret, unless you're Dr. Hoffman, you were as good as dead. And Naomi, sure. they're trying to protect Naomi with a lie. They tell Naomi, Ben tells Naomi that his that her son has a sleeping sickness, that the witch put him under some put him under a sleeping, like a sleeping sickness spell or something. And he it, she tells her he can't come out of the coffin during you know during the day. He has to lay like that. And because Forbes has told her, well, he's the Collinsport strangler. Um, you know, and she doesn't she doesn't want to believe it at all. And she actually calls, you know, Forbes out on this because after what Ben told her, and he goes, Well, why don't you just wait till your son gets out of that coffin at night? Yeah, Forbes is still not putting two and two together that Barnabas is a vampire. And so... Well, you know, yeah, they don't have a context. For right. So you have this moment where it, Forbes just honestly believes that Barnabas is the Collinsport Strangler. Now, he's not wrong, but he doesn't realize what Barnabas really is. Which I, yeah. like, I like that little... Fixed by the writers that you know what let's keep the mystery away from this person until it's way too little way too late and then it gets them killed i agree yes i agree what did you think I of agree. dan's, dan's no, direction sorry. or sorry what uh dan's direction in this episode it's um it's 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 flashy it will be flashier at the end of the year. You know, I he directs a, a, an arc of episodes that I call Time Trap, mm-hmm. where, where Barnabas again comes back to this time period. Mm-hmm. And that's, that to me is really, really, really interesting. Um, so, uh, yeah, that I think... Um, and certainly in Time Trap, which I am very familiar with, um, he uses lighting, he uses shadow, he uses camera movement in an almost prowling, predatory fashion. Um, uh, when I, uh, when I, when, when the rondos occurred, um, I, uh, the Dave Colton read uh, my, uh, my my so uh, a piece from that and uh it's it's clear that he was he was having fun and uh that uh that certainly i enjoyed writing about it very much um so uh it's 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 much it's much more evocative you know when dan talks about the classic horror and so on and so forth that's uh, that's evident in what he has he has here. Yeah. You know, I think I think you see him building up to that in a in a big way. Yeah, he really 
he does a really great job too with this episode and how he again I love the cinematic camera work we're getting in this episode. And I also love the fact I that agree. How he shoots, yeah. I love how he shoots the final scene. He shoots it at a distance, like somebody is watching Barnabas and Millicent. And then you hear the you hear the scream of Naomi. And I love how he shoots that. How, yeah. You know. I think it's yeah. it's a really yeah, cool um... No, please continue. It's a really good master stroke of, you know, we don't have to zoom in on a neck bite. We can show it at a distance. And what we're really saying is Naomi is about to get the shock of her life. And I love how they do it. They do it very cleverly. It could be anybody watching them. And when you hear the scream, you know it's Na- that's when you know you could i guess you could get the sense that you know it's naomi but i love how they do this where they just you're watching it from afar like someone's watching barnabas and millicent and then you hear naomi scream it's just a mm-hmm. really 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 cool shot i i completely agree you wanted to talk about yeah. that Episode mm-hmm. one, uh, one thousand one hundred thirteen. Um, you wanted to read something. I, from I did. Yeah, um, because I'll, Joel, I'll, I'll tell you, I didn't know we were doing them in this order, and so I have been scrambling to remember everything I could about this episode. And I basically have just been repeating back what you've said, but I've changed the wording a little bit to make it sound like I was contributing something. I was basically like Chat GPT for you. I was it, you. You were chatting with an AI version of McCray, and let me tell you, never has intelligence been more artificial than uh, than what than what I was just serving up. So, uh, yeah, I I I would love to talk about the this this uh, four fifty six uh, at length. Um, um, we soon know, uh e- even more so. But yeah, eleven thirteen is an episode that I had. Um, that I had forgotten I liked as much as I did. And I, uh, this is one of the pieces I wrote shortly after, um, shortly after the Dark Shadows Day book book came out. And, you know, one of the things that I've experienced is that I kind of get a, a benefit or something like that and then I feel like I, I have to work even harder to earn it. And last night when I was uh, when I was I was driving into town, um, I uh, I had to stop midway through and, and go to sleep on the road. But uh, that's that's neither here nor there. Um, but in in Daybook Unbound, um, I, you know we the audio book came out, so I was very excited and. This was a piece that I had forgotten. I I I liked as much as I did, uh, and so there's a lot going on in it. And I was really eager to discuss it with you and get your thoughts. So this is actually the 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 fastest, bestest way I think maybe to catch up with it. And so if you'll indulge me, uh, I would like to read this particular day book as just kind of a launching point for the discussion. May I do so? Absolutely, go ahead. You are a gentleman. 11.13. Barnabas Collins decides that the only man who can help him avert the apocalypse is the last man he can trust, himself. Barnabas Jonathan Frid. Repeat, 30 minutes. Summary. Gerard thinks he has Julia by the short hairs when he dangles a newfound earring in front of her as evidence that she comes from another time. Her explanation is credible enough to send Gerard away, leaving her time to conspire with Ben Stokes about recruiting Barnabas for the campaign. Ben finds Barnabas in the old house, uh, conniving 
what is it, Brian from Barnabas, uh, in the old house, uh, saying goodbye to Josette's portrait and dominance over his future. As he reasons with the vampire, the present day version of Barnabas consults with Ben's descendant. Surrounded by an insane Carolyn and a suicidal Quentin, Barnabas is compelled to use the I Ching ones to take the battle to 1840. He immediately encounters the vision of Josette's grave. So that's what happens in the episode. Now, as you listen to me read this, I want you to hear in your mind the music from Back to the Future. Okay? Because that's what was going through my head as I wrote this whole thing. What an episode. Okay, here we go. Dark Shadows is turning it to its most forbidden topic, endings. The job of a soap opera is to perpetuate misery. It resolves one source only after it slides in another. But this phase of the show is replete with endings, conclusions, and assorted apotheoses. We've seen Collinwood destroyed, and that's how the ending begins. How do you top that? That kind of question surges within 1113 with urgent power. It begins with fatalism and then asks, is that all you got? This is the perverse optimism that you find only at funerals, because when the universe falls apart, the only certainty is change. With Barnabas, we even see double. The show continues its audacious presentation of a parallel storyline. Two different centuries with overlapping casts and one character appearing in both. The most unique acting challenge for Jonathan Frid is playing two different versions of Barnabas, both of whom have their counterparts in the relative future. And Dark Shadows is the only show where the future is 130 years in both directions. This storyline has a bad rap for being confusing. And I suppose if you struggle to do things like drop pennies and straighten unknotted rope, you'll find this baffling. But if you can manage those arduous tasks, 1840 is a pleasure. Barnabas Collins may be the long-suffering and occasionally non-beating heart of Dark Shadows, but Julia Hoffman is its soul. And drop me a line if you can really explain the difference, but it sounds good. Following her into 1840, it's clear how far she has come. She began as a conniving, intellectually ruthless, arrogant invader. If Collinwood tortures its beloved sons and daughters, you can imagine when an outsider puts it in a bad mood, Julia pays her dues. Now she's on the other side of that process. Her scene at the beginning of the episode is a well-earned tribute to smugness. She deflects Gerard's smarmy interrogation with a cool efficiency that borders on decadent relish. Julia knows that she could die at any point. She knows that she is far over her abundantly quaffed head. Not only is she fearless, but she has learned to take pleasure in hoisting her enemies with extra petard. Supernatural bullies specialize in lording forbidden knowledge uh, over the rest of us, and Julia frustrates their efforts. Her sense of take that is not only admirable, it's infectious. Had Julia, had Victoria Winters remained on the show, this is the main character we might have gotten, although I doubt it. Julia's age, gumption, and guile are impossible to imagine with anyone else. We are seeing Dan Curtis's dream after all just by way of the real world. Meanwhile, Barnabas finally takes down the painting of Josette. After all, she let go of it, and she has given him permission to move on. That's on her end. This is the matter of his own choice. It involves the sort of courage that people can only show when they are too close to a tragedy. There's a grace period in the time immediately following a tragedy uh, before its burdens become a part of us. Oddly, decommissioning Josette is a job that could only be accomplished by the 1840 version of Barnabas and the 1970 version of Barnabas. Anything in between had just enough time to become obsessed with his loss, but not enough experience to contemplate life without it. Barnabas is speaking for himself and the writers when he boasts, the word safe has no meaning for me. It's an extraordinary point of freedom. Everything is possible because nothing is possible. It's the same kind of desperate bravery shown by the producers as they introduce a backward echo of Pansy Fay with the nobler ancestor, Letitia Fay. 
It's a character whose existence has no practical sense, but has such a poetic ring of truth that pedantic cavils are undone before they can be spoken. Letitia is there because it's the most interesting continuing character that Nancy Barrett crafted. And because Nancy Barrett intrinsically belongs at Collinwood as its neurotic and self-punishing ray of light. And who has the time to wallow in trivia when they have a 50-year-old soap opera to write about? One of the story's primary themes is the decay of our aspirations over time. The introduction of Letitia manages to accomplish this backward. Somehow, Letitia is an ancestor, and somehow, and it may just be the semiotic impact of a more natural hair color, Letitia feels a little more humane and relatable. And she's not the only double in the episode. Letitia is confident in her use of the supernatural. But Nancy Barrett also plays the vaguely psychic Carolyn in 1113. Her encounter with the paranormal has driven her quite mad, pitting the two characters against each other. Similarly, we have a scene in 1840 where Ben Stokes reasons with his former master to show courage and trust. This transitions to a scene over a century later in the same house where Elliot Stokes shows a newly dawning sense of hesitation and Barnabas must rally him into action. Moments before, the 1970 Barnabas is introduced under a looming portrait of himself from a haughtier and happier days. He is attached to his chair, hamleting himself to the point that a skull may appear at the palm of his hand at any moment. Barnabas is either on the verge of implosion or explosion. He seethes with Stokes's report on the funerals for Carrie, Daphne, Elizabeth, and the assassinated future of the Collins family, David. These are unthinkably bold and permanent strokes of storytelling. They engage Barnabas as they engage us. He has spent his second and third lives doubting his place in the future, and it has suddenly passed him by. It is in this moment that Barnabas truly appreciates the ability that makes him unique. He alone can use the curse of immortality to travel within his own lifespan in either direction. For the trip to 1897, this discovery was an accident. Now, its invocation is a mandate. Barnabas rallies to a rare moment of decisive and ferocious action at the thought. He can only be haunted by the past for so long. Within the space of just a few lines, this gentleman of the past again becomes the last best hope for the future. A year ago, this might have been executed with a sense of insouciant elan worthy of Alexandre Dumas. Frit avoids letting any twinkle spark his eye. Too many people have died. Too many regrets filled the ledger. Yes, he's answering the call to adventure, but it is with gravitas and respect. And yet again, the series reinvents itself. Too often he is written off as a villain, literally defanged after his first few months. I will admit he spends a frustrating amount of time doubting his next move. But even when Barnabas is at his most mournfully indecisive, he is to me the great man. It's in scenes like these today that we see why. In fact, those other moments of ethical denial and over-intellectualized paralysis are what make episodes like 1113 such a joy. And the universe surrounding him seems to be in agreement. Even Elliot argues with him about the risks of such a journey. Carolyn glides downstairs for a late afternoon cocktail and yet another nervous breakdown as Quentin tries to hang himself upstairs. As if to prove Barnabas's point, once Barnabas tries a tentative trance, the first thing he sees is Julia Hoffman's tombstone from 1840. A call to adventure indeed. And you want to talk about risk, Professor Stokes? Let's talk about risk. Risk may be James T. Kirk's business, but for Barnabas Collins, it is very life. And I can say the same for Dan Curtis. This episode was broadcast September 30th, 1970. So, Hell of an episode. Thanks. Yeah, Incredible. hell of an episode. I think, too, with this episode, before Barnabas goes back, he knows that mm -hmm. if he doesn't go, if he doesn't go back, he's he's not only lived, not, lived 1995, he has literally seen 
how 1995 happened. Him and Julia couldn't stop it. So he Mm -hmm. goes, I have nothing left to lose other than my life. And what ha- and really, what has that been? But one giant tragedy after the other. And it's really and, and even I good. Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, you know, what does I have nothing to lose but my life mean to a man who's already dead? Yeah. Yep. That's a very existential question. It's a huge question. He is beyond life and death. Uh, he is simultaneously experiencing the best that existence could possibly offer and denies every man and the worst that it could possibly curse people with. Yeah. And it's another reason. Now, I know he doesn't do it in this episode. It's another reason he rolls the dice and says, you know what? I'm going to trust Angelique. I'm going to. I need to do something because I can't do nothing. And not trusting Angelique would be doing nothing. You know, or at least a step in that direction. And I love how, and again, I know it's not in this episode, but the one thing you see, he goes back to prevent a friend's death, to prevent Julia's death. Someone who he considers as much of a best friend as Sarah was. I think Julia and Willie are his first real considerations for best friends outside of Sarah. Not I love Victoria. I don't think yeah. I, I don't think that his yeah. his consideration for Victoria as best friend or as strong as Julia and Willie, if that makes sense. Sure. I mean, it's like that Marilyn quote, you know, you can't take me at my worst and deserve me at my best. And, you know, anyone who doesn't really have full disclosure about who Barnabas really is can't approach that. I mean, I would I would say even Sarah is not his best friend. Sarah may be the love of his life, the real love of his life, you know, not in a creepy way, but uh, but um, but is but Ben Stokes. Yeah. Ben Stokes is 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 the I think first in line best friend, yeah. uh, and then and then and Willie and you know when he when Barnabas is going back in time to you know see what he can do for Julia, um, you know it, it was just Julia's job eventually to sort of support Barnabas, and that's all. It's like sort of like you know, uh, I Julia. If you take care of me, I'll take care of the world. Yeah. But you don't have to take on the world. You just have to take care of me. And and that's sort of the, the, the implicit agreement. You know, in this case, Julia is the one. And Barnabas is realizing, oh, my God, if it weren't for me, she would be at a medical convention in St. Thomas. You know, she she'd be she'd be writing a paper and having a good time, waving a shiny disc in front of some neurotic divorcee's eyes, and picking up a check. And that's I messed that up, and so I have to I have to make good on it. Yeah, I mean they've come. Him and Julia. I mean him and Willie came a long way too, but him and Julia's relationship has come a very very long way. <laughs> From where it once was. It's so great. It's so great. And, you know, there's a moment when they first arrive in 1995 where I think you see Julia really complete the main part of her journey. Uh, And that's where Barnabas says something like, oh, I've lost Roxanne. Julia, you'll never know what it's like to have love and have it not be there for you. And she's like, okay. <laughs> you know, and she's like, if you want to still cling to that narrative, Barnabas, I love you enough. I'm not going to do that. But you can tell she kind of, she has such a, a you know, I'm going to use a naughty, vaguely naughty term. People don't respect Grayson Hall's acting are morons 
and they can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. They're entitled to their opinion, but they're wrong. Uh, and in my opinion, uh, Grayson Hall's tremendous. In that moment, in that episode, the, where she just, she has like 13 different expressions that all play across her face in, a, in an instant uh, with incredible unity and subtlety as she takes in what uh, what Barnabas says. And it's just like, she, she's like, she's, she's, she's agreeing with him. She's disagreeing with him. She's amused by him. She's touched by him. She feels sorry for him. Uh, she finds him vaguely ridiculous and, and lovable and naive. And maybe she thinks that Barnabas is in on his own BS and she's just deciding to play along. But God, and so that is, it's, and so really we're dealing with Barnabas kind of, I think, realizing that Julia's in on it, in on his own delusion and is agreeing to play along. And God, what a friend. Of course I've got to rescue her. Yeah. Or help her rescue me, maybe. Because we're dealing with two Barnaby now. Yeah. I mean, he when he goes back, you can still see that Julia has the cross held out. And he, he's given her information about what's going on in the future. And he says to her, he goes, now with Barnabas from, you know, 1840, know all this? You know, no, he wouldn't. And Julia realizes, okay, this is my Barnabas now. And it's a great moment. It really is. And I love how Julia tells him that, you know, she's she's met Gerard Styles, but it, it's weird because Gerard Styles does not seem like the man that we met in 1995. New slash uh, spoiler alert. It's because he's not in a sense. Um, they, we, they haven't made the big reveal of Judah Zachary yet, which I like. You know, there, there's a lot of great things in this episode from a suspense standpoint because the writers are giving a, well, Julia Hoffman could die and this could all just be for, for nothing if Barnabas doesn't get back in time. And the person who could kill mm -hmm. Julia is, is another Barnabas. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, um, and, and so she has to defend herself and preserve the timeline and make sure Barnabas has a rental to occupy when when he arrives at the gate. What what did you think of? I, I know he his character gets killed off. What did you think of eighteen forty Ben Stokes? Uh, I mean, he's he's the same wonderful source of life. You know, Barnabas is home. However, 1840 is kind of this amazing visual extension of everything since 1970 or 1995. You know, starting in 1995, everything glamorous just looks bad. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that was glamorous just looks bad. And, and that makeup, I mean, he looks like he's covered in cancer. It's not old age makeup. It's just, it's it's grotesque and sweaty and mean and weird. And and yet that's that's not Ben Stokes. That's the universe yeah. that we have entered into. I mean, I, I remember when I did the watch through and I was so exhausted and getting to... Uh, you know, the 1970s and just seeing, I think maybe they got some improvements in the camera work or something because you can see the pock marks and David Selby's skin and just the sweat and the sheen and everything looks a little grimier and grittier. It's kind of like in autofocus, in the movie autofocus, as it goes on, the, the, the stock of film and everything changes and everything just looks so 70s and gross. And that's perfect because it is a 70 it is a 1970s gross kind of gritty paul schrader world that we're starting to enter into where there are real actions and real consequences and 
it is it's like a 1970s taxi driver like movie for dark shadows and look of ben stokes when we first see him we get to 1840 is our big cue for that yeah i love how <laughs> how uh yeah, Ivan, whatever you want to call him, Ivan Miller. Uh, Ivan Miller? Yeah, or, uh, God, I, I can't uh, ever, uh, not Judah Zachary, but uh, uh, Gerard Stiles. Um, I, love yeah. how, I love how Gerard Stiles is questioning her about the earring. <laughs> it's like, James Storm is just so slick. Like you could tell, he's being very sly with her too. <laughs> um, yeah, definitely. You know, and and Gabriel wants the ear because he compliments his girlish bouffant. <laughs> uh, Gabriel is a is a cold, cold man. <laughs> he is. But, you know, it, it, I think Gabriel, beyond Edward, is maybe my favorite character on this show. Uh, because as evil as he is, there are times when you can step back and see the massive amount of BS that he has to roll his way through. And that we can kind of be on his side and think, you know, if I were stuck in this weird world, uh, God, I might... I might have some of the same observations he does because he always, even though he lies constantly, he always somehow tells the truth at the same time. And, you know, panic just again, that guy. Yeah. I, I really like how he plays the character of Gabriel with, you know, in 1840 and in 1841 parallel time. I mean, it wasn't the same exact character. And, I know oh. it, sound, it might sound silly to some, but that couldn't have been easy. For an actor? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, don't know. I, mean, I he, you know, th th yeah. It, it was a challenge, definitely. Yeah. Um, uh, and But, you know, Pennock just strikes me as someone so relentlessly creative yeah. so you know just so possessed with ideas and passion for them that gay yeah, he's the guy for the job and he he does a really great job the fact that here's gabriel in 1840 he's in a wheelchair we we think he's paralyzed that he can't walk and we know that they're gonna reveal that he isn't but Christopher Panart just plays the character as such a menacing force, which I like. Even, even with he doesn't he doesn't realize that Gerard Styles is when he doesn't realize Gerard Styles has been possessed by Judas Zachary, he's still wanting to get rid of Gerard Styles. <laughs> and I it, like it, you know he's just messing up the towels. <laughs> He's just messing with the towels. I think they have one working bathroom in Collinwood, and they just got the plumbing installed, and Gerard's always in there. He's working on his hair, but, did I ever but he's you, always in there, and Gabriel's on that door. Did I ever tell you who my favorite uh, Christopher Pennock character was? Uh, no. Sebastian. Who is your favorite? And then ask me. Sebastian Shaw. Sebastian Shaw. That's the one that Pennock said he had the hardest time sort of mastering. So I think that would please him. My favorite Christopher Pennock character is whatever the last Christopher Pennock character I saw was. Yeah. You know, whatever whatever character I saw him play most recently is my favorite. Is my favorite Pennock character. Doesn't cool. matter. Cool. Yeah. I the reason I like. His performance as Sebastian Shaw, he really comes across as very sympathetic, even though there's things he has to do that he's where he he wants you can tell he wants to tell the truth. He's playing a very 
he's played he's played heels he's played you know it, characters that have gone bad but this is his first real to me in my opinion gray great character he's not necessarily all the way good but he's not all the way bad either and i love what he does with the character it's it's i i seem to recall that this might have been panic's favorite character it was certainly right up there yeah it's it's you know i think along with john yeager yeah john yeager was i mean him the way he did john yeager was masterful i do in my opinion i think Christopher Pennock is the best version of Jekyll and Hyde, in my opinion. Even I though, agree. even though it's not I, necessary, about right? You know that. Um, yeah. Is there anything you want to add about episode one thousand one hundred and thirteen before we go? Uh, I think it's great, and and it is. You know, for, for people who kind of get off the bus sometime around parallel time, they just say, okay, I'm done with Dark Shadow Shadow. You know, which there's a demographic of people who say, you know what, I can just go back and start from 210 and be happy. Why are you missing out on the payoff? Yeah. And that's one of the places you really, really, really get it. So that's my Dark Shadows thought for the night. My, my send off for this episode is very simple. If you want to find, if you thought Back to the Future was just pure fun and intensity and crazy, Dark Shadows has you covered on this one. <laughs> on this episode, <laughs> and it really it does, it does a sure great does. job of build of. Is Barbus going to make it back to save Julie in time? We're about to find out. <laughs> tune in tune in same literally same bat time same yeah. bat channel yeah yeah mm-hmm. uh, back to the bone link to the dark shadows day book of bounds going to be the scripture box go pick up the physical edition if you haven't already um patrick or you- get it on audible yeah or get it on it's now on audible you can get yeah. it on amazon 11 and a half hours read by mary d johnson Holy pants, is it a great, great reading. Cool. That is awesome, buddy. When could you come back, Patrick? Hey, whenever you want. When do you want? Tomorrow? <laughs> what do you want, Mary? You want the moon? Just say the word. I'll throw a lasso around it. Drag it down here for you. So let's let's do tomorrow night and let's see. You You go ahead and pick the episode. I'll let you pick. Oh my. Um well in that case, let's what the hell? Let's do eleven eighteen. Let's pick up just a little bit after this and uh and and see where Barnabas is five episodes later. All right. I'm I'm uh, is ten thirty good for you. I love it. Okay. I'll see you tomorrow night, my friend. For Patrick McCray, I'm Joel Sainz. You folks have a great night. <laughs>